If you would, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. We are looking at the songs of Christmas, and we're going to look at the last one. And it is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And in Luke chapter 2, we are going to look at a man named Simeon. Simeon, the name, uh, actually one of Jacob's sons was named Simeon, one of the tribes of Israel named Simeon. And he was this character that is testifying to who Jesus truly is and why he has come. We have seen these testimonies that took place from Joseph and Mary and all that they said, also from the angels. And now in Luke 2, we are looking at this testimony of this dear old man. That's why he's described here. He's an older man that's been waiting his whole life to see this one event. And as we look at this passage, we are examining how God does two things. One, we see God keeps His promises no matter what. And not only does God keep His promises no matter what, we also see that God is absolutely sovereign in history. In having the Christ child, the Messiah, come at the perfect time, in the right place that prophecies had, di- had predicted, in the right family, for the right purpose. And you look at how all that came about and you have to sit back and you go, God is absolutely in control. And sometimes we don't know it and sometimes we don't acknowledge it. And we can't hardly figure it out that somehow God in all of his wisdom and all of his power bringing things about for his glory and his purpose just like he said he would. Amen? For the Bible says that every one of God's promises is yes and amen. In him, therefore, through him, we also say, let it be, Lord, let it be. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Revelation chapter 19, 10 says this, talking about John falling before the angel. And I fell at his feet and I worshiped him. But he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold firmly to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Worship God, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The whole testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ is the culmination of all that has been said and all that was predicted and all that the Lord put in the Word of God. It is a prophecy. So, in other words, listen, here's what we are to do for 2024. I hope you learn to write that 2024 and to say that. It's, it'll be odd, but just by the time you get used to writing 2023, they change it on us, don't they? But in 2024, that you would make a declaration that I will be, two things, one, I will be righteous and I will be devoted. And in Revelation chapter 19, 10, the angel says, don't worship me as if to say, don't worship anything else. You worship God. And you join him in that. And that's Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, as it says. And in this passage, starting in verse Well, let's just look at um, 22. On the day of purification, Luke 2, 22. And when the days of purification, according to the law of Moses, were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Just as it is written in the law, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord in a pair of turtle doves or a young pigeon. Verse 25. So this is like 40 days after his birth. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout. He was righteous and he was devout. That's what we should be, righteous and devout. Looking forward to Israel's consolation. And the Holy Spirit was on him, or another translation, in fact, almost all the other translations translate it, he was in the Spirit, which is actually very accurate. He was in the Spirit. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, notice that the Holy Spirit is used three times in three verses. And if you know anything about Luke, you know Luke was definitely right and he gets description of the work of the Holy Spirit 
in the Gospel of Luke and also in the book of Acts that we just finished a month ago. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit in verse 27. Simeon, guided by the Spirit, he entered into the temple complex. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace. By the way, this song is called uh, Nunc Dementis, and it comes from this phrase right here. You can release your servant. In other words, he can take me home. I've seen what you told me I would see. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon, after he grabs Jesus and he's holding him, and he makes this incredible declaration. And Joseph and Mary were amazed at this happening. And then he turns his attention. Watch what happens. Then Simeon blessed them and he told his mother, Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And so, in other words, Jesus, as Jesus even said, I didn't necessarily, in my coming, didn't bring peace to all people, right? He even said, I even came and I brought a sword that when you have to, you must make a decision about Jesus. He either is exactly who he says he is or he's not. And if he is exactly who he says he is, then you give him your worship, you give him your all, and you follow him. And, but if you don't, then your life takes another direction. Those who do see Jesus for who he is, and they surrender them, their lives radically change. And those who don't, their lives are over here, and there's a major contention. So there is a rise and fall based upon how you see Jesus you cannot, listen, you and I cannot just say, Jesus is just something I add a little bit to my life so that I can fit in or so that he might bless me once in a while and then I live my life like the rest of the world. That's not the message of Jesus. This is not why he came. He made it very clear that there are two roads. One road is broad and wide and many are those who go down that road, but the road he chose and the road he calls us to is narrow and few are those who find it. There's a clear line of demarcation. Those who are followers of Jesus and those who are not, and there is a natural contention. There's as much contention or difference, and it's described as light and darkness. There's a difference. It's described as sheep and and goats. There's a difference. There's a difference in the way you relate to God. There's a difference in the way you relate to people. There's a different calling on your life. Everything changes. There's a different destination. The wide road leads to destruction, an eternal destruction. The narrow road leads to heaven and leads to the presence of God. And so when Simeon says this, he's He's saying something extremely profound. He is taking the whole message of Scripture and in Simeon's exuberance in worshiping the Lord, and then he turns to Mary and he said, this, this Jesus is going to radically change. He's going to cause a rise and a fall. Look at what it says. A rise and a fall. And then, indeed, <clears throat> he caused the fall and a rise of many in Israel. And, and to be a sign that will be opposed. And look at verse 35. This is tough. And a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And they're just kind of looking at Mary and saying, look, this is incredible news. And he worships the Lord. And we're going to look at that in a second. But he looks at Mary and he said, but things are going to get rough. Let me ask you a question serious question. If you knew that following the Lord and all the joys and all the benefits and all the, the sonship rights that you have and the incredible inheritance and the eternal life, and you knew that following Jesus 
which is the right way, was going to cause pain in your life, would you still follow him? It's a, it's a good question. In fact, I'm, I'm standing in front of many giants in the faith, if not all of you, and your whole life has answered that question. You've chosen to be faithful in the midst of difficult times. But there's a popular message that's going out. Or there's a popular way of presenting the message of the gospel. And it goes something like this. It's, man, if, if you trust Christ in all the sermons and all the teachings and all the books on the shelves of all the Christian bookstores are kind of quiesced to a self-help book, of how God can give you a much better life now. Now, I do believe that. I believe my life is enormously better because I knew the Lord Jesus Christ. But... It doesn't mean that it's void of any kind of trouble or any kind of sorrow or specifically here, a piercing of the heart. So Joseph and Mary, if you're following the story and following the sermons, you know that they had a pretty rough life. In fact, it starts off that they're offering, uh, whether it's turtle doves or whether it's a pigeon, um, it, 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 it tells us that they were not people of, of, of standing. They were humble. They were in a humble situation. They... Uh, their home was incredibly humble. They, they didn't have, their, their family had rejected them. And they didn't have money to buy the lamb because according to Exodus, I'm sorry, Leviticus, they were supposed to offer a lamb. But because of their station in life and their limited amount of funds, there was a, uh, there was a concession that was made. If you don't have money to buy a lamb, then maybe you could just offer two little turtle doves and you can, you can catch those anywhere. They're all over the place. Or pigeons. Get you a pigeon. Just go to, the, go to the park bench and just, anyway, that's what, the, and so what it tells us, it tells us a couple of things. First of all, the wise men hadn't visited them yet, you know, the, the, the little nativity scene and you got the wise men there. It's a little bit off. You know that. It's a little bit off. It, they didn't come until probably two years later. So, and, and when they came, they brought a lot of, you know, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And so they probably, the, 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 the wise men hadn't been there to visit them yet. So they're, they're in a, they're in a, the tough situation, they, the long journey that they had, the, the rejection they had from the family and being, being united with the Lord and worshiping Him and being used by God sometimes creates pain in and of itself. And that's what we find. But look what else he says. And there was a man in Jerusalem, verse 25, Simeon. Here's our guy. He's our guy, Simeon. A man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This was a righteous and a devout man looking forward to Israel's consolation and the Holy Spirit was upon him. That sentence is just fantastic. That, that sentence should describe each one of us, really. That, that we desire to be righteous. We desire to be devout. And we desire for the Holy Spirit to be upon us because we are looking for the consolation of Israel. Because you look for the consolation of Israel. Now, you know, a little background. Here's what's going on. And Israel, Israel's in trouble, right? Israel, Israel's a mess. Israel was God's people. And, and, you know, God gave Abraham a promise. And God made it clear that Abraham and Sarah, that they would have a son despite their advanced age. And they had a son. He promised to give Israel the land of Canaan. And they got the land of Canaan. Because when God promises, He fulfills it. And not one of God's good promises, which the Lord has made to the house of Israel, has failed. All has come to pass that He promised. The Lord promised David, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever, and your throne shall be established forever. And that the promise will ultimately be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, who will sit on the throne of David. And so what He's saying is, all of these promises are coming to fruition, even though... Israel did not stay righteous or devout. They, they messed up. Israel just messed up. They had the law of God. They had the presence of God. There they are at the temple, which their the temple complex is massive, right? And it's beautiful. Herod built it. It's all pretty. He, he, he rebuilt it. It had been destroyed, right? But all it was was just blocks and gold and stuff like that. God's presence had left in the book of Ezekiel. And so they were just going through the motions. And so they were there at the temple of what once was, of what once it used to be. And now it's just real pretty, but yet it has no substance. Did you know, beauty is fleeting, right? Beauty is fleeting. 
the things of this earth that we think are so attractive, but yet that has no substance to it. In fact, we are, we are people that we are prone to fall susceptible in, in, into the lie of beauty and following after things instead of the substance and the reality of the Lord God Almighty. It's a plague on our country. And it was a plague upon Israel. Israel was a group of people who God had chosen and God had done great and mighty things through, but because they were no longer righteous and they no, were no longer devout to the, to the right things, that God had turned them over to themselves. God allowed them to drift in their carnality. And when Jesus comes onto the scene, you got John the Baptist who was preaching before his, Jesus' inauguration of ministry, and he was talking about repentance, repentance, repentance. Show me fruits of repentance because the ax is about to hit the tree and it's about to all come tumbling down, which it did in 70 AD. And so there was a warning to turn back because their hearts had become so hard. They, um, they get involved in many, many problems. Um, they got involved in, <clears throat> in Israel, kind of like what we do, um, as a group, as a mass. And so you have all these masses of people. You had groups within Israel. And when you'd have one loud mouth that would say, listen, we're, we're starving out here in the desert. What are we going to do? And the next thing you know, everybody would go around them and say, yeah, you're talking about my pain too. I'm really hungry. I'm really thirsty. And say, yeah, that Moses is a bad guy. Yeah, he is. And they would have a, a group, this whole mass of people, would turn away from what God had promised, turn away from the prophet of God, and they would begin to think as one group, and they would march together in the wrong direction. And the reason that masses do that is because masses are made up of people like you and me. People that oftentimes leave our moorings, leave righteousness, and run towards feelings and accommodations, and we want to experience new things, or we want to experience uh, whatever our heart tells us to experience, and we end up going astray. And when we do that in a mass, it, we lather ourselves with foolishness is what happens. And we all are capable of it. You and I are capable of running away from the Lord who loves us because we follow our own hearts instead of following what God says. And so Israel had done that. Israel had, found, had, had followed religion. They still were devout to religion, but they were no longer devout to God. They were devout to just going to church and going through the motions and going through the symbols without truly understanding the meanings. And they had left the presence and the will of the Lord and God allowed them to do that. How many of you know that God will allow us to run down in the wrong direction if we so desire. Romans chapter 1 is so clear. That's being turned over to a reprobate mind. When you choose to leave the things of God, it's as if God says, you want more rope? <laughs> Here it is. But it's not going to go well for you. It just won't. And then eventually there's a time to turn. And so we can go the wrong direction. So what keeps us from becoming like Israel did? What keeps us in the middle of God's will? And what will allow us to take 2024 and a year from now? Do you remember, do you remember a year ago? I stood right here and I said, so who are you going to be a year from now? Are you going to be closer to the Lord? Or are you going to be farther from the Lord? Are the, are the most important relationships in your life, are they going to be more meaningful or are they going to be more strained? And you and I have a choice. 12 months ago, 365 days ago, what have you been doing in the last 365 days? To make sure, what have I been doing? To make sure that my relationship with the Lord is full of righteousness and devotion and to experience the Lord. And so... I don't expect all of you to give an answer right now. 
That would be odd. However, you do need to give an answer. Not so much to me, but to the Lord. What have I done as a steward of time, a steward, a manager of all the moments you gave me, of the relationships, being someone who is a steward and a manager of tender hearts all around us? Uh, what have we done? And I, I would imagine everyone is growing because you want to live righteously and you want to be devout, devoted. But what about the next 24, I'm sorry, what about the next 12 months? What about the next, in, in 2024? What is it going to be like a year from now? I mean, you're going to, I mean, it's a good chance you'll be here next year. So what will you be like? What will you become? Will you become what God has in mind for you? Will you become the kind of person that God has in mind? Will you begin to experience the very identity that the Lord has placed in you and the very calling and that each one of us has a very distinct and unique calling that's centered around your, the personality you have and the gifts that you have and the uniqueness that you are and God has something very, very specific for you. Think about Simeon. Simeon was a righteous man. He was a devout man. But there was something that God gave him to do. God, it's as if God had a drum roll going. And it was going for years and years. And he didn't know when it would hit the crescendo and go, ching. You know, just, just wait, brother. Here it comes. Just wait. Here it comes. And day after day after day. Hanging out at the temple. When is the Messiah going to come? When is he going to be here? What is he going to be like? Who is, how is this going to happen? When you got Herod, that heretic, when you got all these, how, in a world like this, and the next thing you know, ching, and this was his time. And he comes up, and here's what he says. Now, master. Now, master. Do you know that is a very unusual way to refer to God in an Old Testament perspective? Under the old order, an old, just a really unique way, my master. Can you say that today? Now, master. So one of our staff members, when we pray, that's the way he always starts his prayer. Oh, master. It's a good word. He's, I'm your slave, master. You are my boss. And that's what he says. You can dismiss your slave in peace according to your word. In other words, you, 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 exactly what you have said, what you have spoken, is, is come true. For my eyes have seen your salvation, and you have prepared it. See, this guy, he understood the way pro how prophecy worked. Prophecy, God's promises, are backed by his own character. We're talking about Yahweh God, who has the full character of omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience, all justice, immutable, never changing, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when he says master, he's talking about the one that spoke something, and then here it is in existence. And he clearly understands this. And he says, this is your salvation and you have prepared it in the presence of all people. Here's what he's saying. I can see it, and I'm excited to make this declaration, but so can everybody else. Everyone is accountable because we have seen it. We have experienced it. We know he is the Christ child. We know the life. In fact, we have the benefit of the rest of the New Testament and all of church history and all the Christian proclamation throughout, throughout the centuries of who He is. And so we know, we have seen it. Listen, if here today and you've never turned to Christ as Lord and Savior or you're watching and you're listening at home, you need to know this, that the Lord has made it known that His Son is the Messiah and you know that. He died on the cross for you after having lived a perfect life. And when He died on the cross, He said, it is finished, meaning that he bore all of your punishment and there's no more punishment for you to bear if you receive him as Lord and Savior. And the moment you do, you are born again. And here's what I can say. You know this. You just heard it. 
You know about Jesus. You know what He has done. And Christians, listen, this is our declaration. This is our battle cry. Jesus is Lord, right? And there's this anticipation. And, you know, I, I would think, I mean, there's a possibility here that if you look at Simeon and you're like, what, did, what drove this guy? Well, he heard from God. He had this confident expectation of hope, this, this, this brilliance of hope within his heart of a prophecy of God that the Messiah is coming. And that made him righteous and it made him devout. Now, listen, let me, let me tell you something. Sometimes our, our, our righteousness and our devotion is misplaced. And that happens. Jesus called it out to the Pharisees all the time. And that is where we're just devoted to devotion. We're just, we, just, we just want to be seen as a devoted person. Or we're devoted to righteousness. We want to be seen as better than anybody else. Or, or we, don't want to, we don't want to deal with the shame of, of falling into sin. Or we just want to stay clean and we want to be prosperous in every way we can. But listen, there is a devotion to what God has said to you. You and I need to be devoted to God Himself, right? You and I need to be devoted to what He has called us to do and to be, and therefore we live righteously. What does it mean to live righteous? What does it mean to live righteous? Well, there's two aspects of righteousness in the New Testament. One is what's called an imputed righteousness. It's it's, it's, it's also in the Old Testament. It's what Abraham experienced, where it says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him or imputed to him as righteousness. It says the same thing about King David, that David believed God and it was imputed to him as righteousness. In other words, positionally, God sees you as righteous. You are now a part of his family. He looks, he looks at you through... <laughs> through the view of just some blood-colored glasses, and he sees you through the blood of Jesus completely washed clean, right? God, the judge, now sees you as righteous. That's imputed righteousness. When you get a, when you get a taste of that and you understand that you are completely accepted in the beloved, you are now God's chosen. You now have the identity of a child of God and He completely changes you because of this imputed righteousness that is a gift. Salvation is a free gift. But there's another aspect. When we understand that, then we just we want to serve Him. And there is what we would call like a practical righteousness. It's what we do every day. What is righteous? What's well, doing what is right? It's, it's following the will and the ways of the Lord God Almighty. It, it includes obedience to what he says. And we are to live righteously. We are, and another way to say it, we are to stay away from sin. Listen, I don't know if you've ever heard anybody say this lately, but man, stop sinning. Stop it. Just stop it. So, well, better. <laughs> it's easier said than done. I know. But if you have no intention at all of stopping sinning, to stop sinning, then you will be a victim to your sin every single time. But if you have an intention, it is my goal, it is, it is my desire, I want to get rid of this stuff in my life. I want to get rid of thoughts. Let's just name some things. Let's talk about some really bad ones. Really bad sins that you and I need to stop. How about envy? Ugh, it's horrible. It derails you and me faster than anything else. In fact, there's probably, I, I, you know, I watched the Cowboys last night. Good game, right? Good game. Uh, my, my son got a chance to lead devotions for the Detroit Lions. And so, and, and I said, well, hey, son, let me, let's make a deal. When you pray over them, don't pray too hard, okay? <laughs> and he said, he said, Dad, I kept one eye open while I was praying. You know, I just said, <laughs> okay, okay. So it worked out all right. But while you're watching and the commercials come on, it's all based on envy, isn't it? It's all based on envy. How about strife? How about strife? You know what strife is? Strife is that thing that just wells up inside of you really quickly when you don't like what's going on. Road rage, right? Anybody? You know what I mean? It's that strife. 
It's, it's, it's not that you disagree with somebody. It's that you're mad that, at them because you disagree with them or you're mad at them because they disagree with you. Strife. Bitterness. Bitterness can, can derail us and so quickly. Um, flat disobedience to parents. It's not talked about enough, but obedience to parents is essential. The Bible talks about it a lot. The book of Proverbs, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Obey your parents. Unforgiveness is a sin. Unforgiveness is, is a... And so these, these go on and on and on and on and on. And, and some of these things are what leads to the, those outward type sins of, of stealing and murder and drunkenness and all these other things. That when you need to get rid of it. Righteousness. Doing what's right. So here's my point. If you, if you don't have an intention of stopping sin in your life, then you are planning on continuing to sin. Christian, listen. Stop. Don't do it. Make a purpose in your heart. And then, and then the next one, devotion. Devotion is very clear. It, you and I, if you, if you really, maybe, maybe you get out a piece of paper and you just kind of journal. And the way you can, one way of journaling is you just get up in the morning and as you're beginning to journal, you just, the first word you write is yesterday, dot, dot, dot. And you begin to evaluate what happened yesterday with actions and feelings and words. And you look at that. And when you do that enough, you all, all of a sudden it becomes glaring what you are devoted to. What you're devoted to. Another way of doing it, um, does anybody, does anybody um, uh, balance checkbooks anymore? Does that happen? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, amen. Or you can just look at your bank statements online. And you just go through and you look at it. Where you've spent your money, you can see what you're devoted to. Or you could, maybe you do your, your quiet time at night and you want a journal. You could just write, today, dot, 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 this is what happened. And it becomes very obvious what I'm devoted to and my attitudes. And the life that isn't evaluated is not worth living. And so devotion is, first of all, you know that you want to be righteous and you, want, you know that you are devoted to the Lord God Almighty. As the angel says in Revelation 19, worship God only. You should be devoted to the Lord God first, right? When you and I are devoted to the Lord God first, like Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, look, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom life? And, and then he basically says, which law do I obey? And what's the greatest of laws? And Jesus says this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul and all of your strength and your neighbor as yourself. Be devoted to loving God and loving others. Be devoted to that. When you're devoted and I'm devoted to the things of God, then it turns out that I'm devoted to my wife. You should be devoted to your spouse. Devoted. Because first of all, you're devoted to God. You should be devoted to your children. Because first of all, you're devoted to God. You should be a great employee, a great employer, because you're devoted to God. Now, first of all, God must be first. If you have more devotion to a spouse, to a job, to children, to a hobby, to finances than you do God, then you're messed up and things won't go well. But when you're devoted to God first, like Simeon, then everything just begins to make sense. And when God begins to use you and just the beauty of all that you are, then you begin to see it happen all around you. You begin to see it. Now, what made Simeon so devoted and so righteous is because he had heard from God. He had heard the promises of the Lord. That God is not finished with you. That God is still has a plan for you. That I'm sending my Messiah and he's going to die for you. He will be the ruler of the world. And Simeon got up every single day. I don't know how many days. Could have been 100 days. I don't know how old he is. It says he's old. He's old. And he made his way to the temple, waiting to see what God would do. Now, here's the sermon. That was all introduction. <laughs> Man, God has promises for you. Man, can you taste and see it? That the Lord is good? Let me tell you one promise God has for you. He has for you specifically. 
Jesus is coming. And you are going to see it. There isn't a person here that isn't going to see the coming of the Lord. Now, it, it may be in our lifetime. I think it will be in our lifetime. But whether, whether our body is dead, but we're still alive, you are going to see it. It's going to be an incredible event. Such, such a, a massive event that the graves are going to bust open. <laughs> I was standing next to a friend of mine. He's a, re, just retired as a colonel chaplain in the United States Army. He's been all the way around the world. And I stand next to him. And he was all, he had all of his medals on. And he had all those stripes here of all the combats he had been in. And I was standing next to him on, it was uh, two days ago, Friday. And we were at a graveside. And my friend's name is Brian Cheppy. We called him Chep, Chaplain Chep. And as we were standing there, uh, one of our closest friends, for, as we all lived together in a community, we went to school together, one of our closest friends was in a coffin. And he was, we were at the graveside. And Cheppy said, he said, every one of them boogers are going to bust open pretty soon, aren't they? And I said, yes, sir, brother. Yes, they are. And we're going to hug Randy's neck, aren't we? And he said, yes, we are. See, Randy's going to see it. If Jesus comes back today or tomorrow, Randy's going to see it. I'm going to see it. My dad who's in heaven is going to see it. We're all going to see it. And because of that day, let me tell you, and because of that event, you can be righteous in 2024. And you can be devoted in 2024. Because you will Christian, you will see the consolation. All the things that are wrong, you're going to see made right. There is a kingdom coming to where the lion will lay down with the lamb. And it'll all be great. And we will experience the rule of Jesus on this very earth. But until then, you need to allow him to rule your heart now. 